it up. So hi everyone, my name is Nav Grewell. I'm a pelvic floor physiotherapist and women's health advocate here in Calgary, Canada. Um, I'm a big believer in essential, free, easily accessible information, and that's why we're here today. So we're going to be talking about preparing for labor, how to ease labor, um, how to prevent tearing, as well as recover faster postpartum. And I'm going to be providing you with information that then you can use to make informed decisions about your health. There is a general lack of information, I feel, in this field um, and information that is easily accessible outside of prenatal classes. And oftentimes they don't cover certain things. Um, and those are the things that we're going to be talking about today. Okay, so I will be collecting some information during the talk from you and there is an evaluation, um, a couple other questions that I'm going to ask at the end. Um, I want to use this information down the line, you know, either for research or to present it, hopefully to, you know, like the government and healthcare to say, okay, these are kind of like the needs of women during pregnancy and postpartum. This is where we need funding. This is where we need free classes to happen so that people have this essential information. You shouldn't have to, I believe, have to pay for a prenatal class. That in itself marginalizes people, right? And that information should be easily accessible. Okay, so I'm going to end this poll, but about 76 percent of people said they want to learn about pushing techniques so that's what you want to learn most we're still going to go over kegels and perineal massage because it's extremely important to go over that but uh, that's just good for me to know okay so let's go over what the talk is going to look like so the session outline is right there in front of you so we're going to talk a little bit about the pelvic floor its structure, its function. If you've come to previous talks of mine, I'm not going to spend as much time going over this stuff, okay? There is, I'll actually put it in the chat box, if you want to learn more in detail about what the pelvic floor is, the core, its function, common conditions, stuff like that. I did an hour talk about that. It's very important information for you to have so that you know what is common um, and then what is kind of like a dysfunction in the pelvic floor and when you should seek help. Okay, so I'm actually going to put that in the chat box immediately because um, if you have any particular questions, I'll probably say, okay, go watch that. Um, and then you have that information as well. And if you just go on my website, you can find it as well. There's a replay to it. Okay, the second thing we're going to talk about is benefits of preparing for labor and delivery, why we should be preparing. And then we're going to cover each section. So perineal massage, okay, breathing and stretches. Kegels, that's a pelvic contraction. We're going to talk about how exactly how to do a Kegel, different types of pushing techniques, um, pelvic physiotherapy. Last session, I didn't spend a lot of time talking about pelvic physiotherapy and there were questions surrounding that that I was getting afterwards. So I can talk a little bit about that as well. And then any questions that you might have along the way. So the pelvic floor. And again, there's a handout section on the left-hand side. If you press handouts, it'll show up with the common conditions for the pelvic floor. So the pelvic floor, this is someone standing sideways and we're looking in. So at the front, you can see the pubic bone. At the back is the spine, which ends in the tailbone. Right behind the pubic bone, we have bladder, uterus, bowel, and the pelvic floor muscles are underneath. So they run from the pubic bone to the tailbone, and they basically support all the organs inside. So they act as a sling, as a hammock, and they structurally support the organs, and they take care of bladder function, sexual function, and bowel function, and they're supporting everything inside. So these muscles are different than other muscles in the body. They have to work all day long. The only time they're supposed to relax is when you go to the bathroom. If they are relaxing at any other point in time, that means they're not doing their job. Okay, and in that case, that can lead to certain signs and symptoms that we're gonna be talking about. The pelvic floor during pregnancy. So why do we always talk about the pelvic floor in pregnancy? It's because there's a lot of pressure on the pelvic floor for nine months, baby sitting on it, your body is growing, the muscles are being stretched out. And so that is why women are more at risk for developing pel pelvic floor conditions and issues during pregnancy, as well as postpartum. Okay, and that is why we tend to focus on the pelvic floor so much. 
And that is a picture that is showing the depth and kind of the amount of muscle we have inside. So that is a view from underneath, okay? And that's showing um, urethra, vaginal entrance, and then anus. Those are the three holes there. And then you can see the amount of muscle that is actually inside. I know the other picture made it seem like there's one muscle inside, but we have a ton of muscle. And finally, the pelvic floor is a part of the core. Okay, so a lot of patients are coming to me postpartum, pointing to their abdomen, saying something along the lines of, now my core feels really weak. How can I strengthen it? Can you give me some exercises? Well, the core is actually the back muscles, hip muscles, the diaphragm, which is a huge breathing muscle, the pelvic floor and hip muscles. Did I say hips twice? I might've said it twice. Okay, but basically everything in that area, in that middle trunk area is the core. The transverse abdominis, in case you're wondering, that is a muscle that wraps around, like saran wrap, around the trunk. And it is the deepest abdominal muscle. So everybody knows about the six-pack muscles that are going in the front, the obliques to the sides. But this is the muscle that is most often implicated if somebody has abdominal separation. And this is the muscle that we then would want to strengthen. Uh, we can do that for prevention, for abdominal separation, and then also to treat it. And then multifidus at the back, that's just joint uh, back muscles that are part of the core as well. Okay, pelvic floor conditions. So these are the conditions that I see most often during pregnancy as well as postpartum. And I'm not going to go into extreme detail with each one. Again, if you would like more information about the conditions, if you're experiencing any of these and you're like, oh, am I experiencing any of these? The handout kind of explains it a little bit. And then the talk that I did a few weeks ago as well, that I put the link for it in the chat box. If you don't see it there, if you logged on a little bit late, then you can see it on my website as well. If you just go to events, it'll say watch the fruit replay. But if you're experiencing any type of leakage, um, so that's urinary leakage or bowel leakage, okay? Coughing, laughing, sneezing can result to that. Uh, physical activity, exercise, lifting baby, um, going from sitting to standing, or it might be happening all the time, okay? Your urgency, frequency, if you feel like you have to go to the bathroom quite often, if you're rushing to the bathroom, you can't make it there in time. Um, if you put the key in the door when you come home and all of a sudden you have to go to the bathroom, same thing. You're waking up multiple times at night and it's not because of baby. Um, that's an issue of the pelvic floor, or that is an issue of the core. Chronic constipation, if diet is controlled, there's no IBS, no sensitivities, no IBD, and you find you have to strain, it's not coming out easily, it could be because the pelvic floor muscles are tight. And then pelvic pain, and I would actually say that's core pain. Okay, so anything in relation to low back, hips, groin, sciatica, pain in the buttocks, um, pubic pain, tailbone pain, anything in that middle area is core pain. Okay, so that is a sign that something's happening in the core and we need to figure out where it's actually coming from and treat that area. Pain with sex is something that I see quite a bit of. Okay, and this is outside of pregnancy. I see this during pregnancy as well as postpartum and postpartum it's most likely to either tearing um, and or an episiotomy, or I actually see this quite a bit after C-section deliveries. It's because they go through the abdomen and so the pelvic floor muscles really clench up underneath. Either way, um, if there's pain with intercourse and you're experiencing it right now, we are going to be discussing uh, with perineal massage, it's the similar massage that we use for both um, things to prepare for labor and delivery as well as to treat pain with intercourse. Um, and the pain with intercourse means pain with sex. Um, and so you'll learn some techniques for that today as well. And then finally, pelvic organ prolapse and diastasis recti. So prolapse means something is coming down. So those pelvic floor muscles literally structurally have to support all the organs inside. If they are not able to, then this is going to sound scary, but the pelvic floor uh, organs uh, can start to slowly descend towards the vaginal entrance. So that's the bladder, bowel, uh, the urethra, as well as the uterus. Okay. And it can vary person to person. Most people, I would say, if they have mild prolapse, do not have any signs and symptoms. That's why I check on every single person coming in because 50% of women post vaginal delivery have some degree of prolapse. And then they're like, oh, can I do crunches? Can I get back to activity? And I'm like, okay, well, let me check internally to see where everything is sitting before you start doing that. Okay. For more moderate to severe prolapse, it would be heaviness, pressure, feeling like 
the vagina is coming down or falling out, feeling like there's something inside, like a bowling ball, um, and just kind of like something, it's like a fuller feeling in that area, and that can be all the time, or it could be after certain activity. So just really pay attention to that. Finally, diastasis recti. So that's abdominal separation. We see this quite a bit postpartum. And um, that's the muscle that goes around like saran wrap. That's implicated in abdominal separation. There's different ways to check for abdominal separation. I usually check on everyone coming in postpartum, regardless of if they're having any symptoms of bulging or they feel like it's split down the middle or they feel, um, you know, their belly is not going away and they still look pregnant. I would be checking on every because especially with prolapse, or sorry, especially with diastasis recti, there's a relationship between abdominal separation and prolapse and low back pain and other pelvic floor issues, okay? So I put this here for you because I would just want you to be aware of these things can happen during pregnancy. If they do, please seek help because we wanna make sure that they are treated, that they don't lead to anything else down the line. And also that you know kind of like what to look out for, okay? So those are the conditions. And I know I went through each one very quickly, but again, I go through it in much more depth in my talk. And I have another one coming up probably in a few weeks that um, I'll be doing, um, talking about this again, okay? So let's move onward. So labor prep. I'm actually going to, yeah, let's talk about the benefits of preparing for labor. And then I'm going to do another poll with you guys. So what is preparing for labor, right? So when we talk about that, a lot of people are like, okay, well, I want to be as strong as possible going into labor, okay? Um, and then I can recover faster postpartum. That's how I think about it. Okay, so I used to work, the first year I graduated from physiotherapy school, I worked with orthopedic surgeons. So these are surgeons that do knee replacements, hip replacements, they do shoulder surgeries. And when anyone is coming in, they are saying, they're not just, you know, saying, well, I'm going to book you for a surgery, I'll see you on that date. They're saying, okay, your surgery date is, let's just say, I don't know, June 6th. Okay, you have three weeks. I want you to go to physiotherapy, okay? I want, you know, go see NAV three times a week, two times a week. Uh, we don't do the same in pelvic physio. I've never seen anyone two or three times a week, but go see someone and make sure you are as strong as possible going into surgery because the stronger you are going into surgery, the faster you're gonna recover after, okay? And we even see this after surgery, after knee replacements, immediately people are getting exercises to do with, Pregnancy, we don't see any of that, okay? As soon as someone, you know, finds out they're pregnant or they're past the first trimester, it should be a thing of, okay, how do I strengthen my body? How do I become as strong as possible? Because that is going to allow you to then recover faster postpartum. But beyond that, so you can see what it says there, preparing for labor uh, shortens the pushing time. So it shortens the second stage of labor, active labor. Okay, so pushing time comes down, effort comes down, prevents pelvic floor issues, reduced tearing, reduced anal incontinence, which is basically saying reduced um, uh, stool coming out, poop coming out, um, and better actually outcomes for babies as well at one in five minutes postpartum. And then it allows you to recover for faster postpartum. So if you want to return back to fitness, um, even just daily activities, you want to be able to, you know, like lift baby and not have back pain. You want to be able to sit and stand or go for a walk and not feel pelvic pressure, not have leakages. So all of that. Okay. Perfect. So I'm going to do a poll at this point because I just want to get a sense of today we're covering, you know, and I know there's a ton of options there. I don't know if you can choose kind of like more than one, but if you've done a prenatal class, I'm sure they've gone over some of these things, but which of the following would you wish to be included in a prenatal course for yourself? Would it be one of them? Would it be multiples of them? Um, and just take a look and kind of see which one you would like. Just because, so I have a family member who delivered six months ago and they ended up getting a sleep specialist. And I was like, shouldn't that information be easily accessible and just be out there for everyone to have? Um, 
What about, you know, breastfeeding, latching, uh, preventing pelvic floor issues? What would you want to have included in your prenatal course that either they're not including right now or you haven't taken a course because, you know, these courses do cost money. So what would you want in there? And that's just good information for me to have down the line as I'm preparing more courses, making more courses, um, and putting out educational information for you for other expecting mothers. Okay. So I'm just gonna keep that open for a little bit more. Um, I mean, you guys are here for a certain reason, so I might be skewed towards that as well, but about half, a third of the, of the people are saying preventing tearing during delivery. And then another third are saying preventing pelvic floor issues postpartum. Okay, so that is huge. Okay, and I get to save these results. So that'll kind of give me an idea as well of kind of like what to focus on. And then about 10% are saying sleep training as well. Okay, thank you so much. Perfect. Okay. Okay, so we are going to, I have a question already, which I'll, 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 address, I'll address this after. Someone just asked me, where do I work out of Calgary? Um, and they would like to book with a pelvic specialist soon. So at the end, I just wanna go over kind of like the content first so you get most of the practical information that you need. And then at the end, I can kind of talk about, you know, where I work out of um, and I'll give you my website and all that stuff, okay? All right, so perineal massage. Okay, so I'm basically teaching you today what I teach all my clients when they're coming in, okay? And I'm gonna teach it exactly like I teach them. Um, if you are one of my patients and you're coming in, we've already gone over this. It's going to be a review for you, obviously, and I might've given you certain techniques to do um, that we, like, you know, I assessed the pelvic floor and told you, you know, like uh, you should really focus on this area because of tension here and other stuff. So focus on that, but it's still gonna be good review for you. Um, okay, and I'm just seeing in the chat box, it says we can only select one, but basically I would select everything for prenatal education. Okay, thank you for that. Okay, so what is perineal massage? What is the perineum? Okay, and why is it called perineal massage? So the perineum is the area in between the vagina and the anus. So I'm going to use my hands now. <laughs> okay, so I'm gonna go like this. Okay, so if this is vagina, this is anus, that part in the middle, there okay so right here that is the perineum okay and the perineum is the area if there is any tearing most likely it would be happening in the perineal area and that is why we do perineal massage okay because we want to make sure that area is relaxed when baby is coming out tearing is minimized okay and perineal massage is something so you can see it says there to do 34 weeks onwards three to four times a week around i usually say about 10 minutes and there's a bunch of different ways to do them perineal massage has been shown to reduce the degree of tearing during delivery it's been shown to if you do perineal massage there's actually less pain afterwards probably because there was less tearing better outcomes for baby as well and shorter pushing time, okay? So it's a great tool to use and there's different ways to do it. So there's three ways. First way would be to do it by yourself using your fingers. Second way would be to do it by yourself using a pelvic wand. You can see that curved thing that's in the picture there. Third way would be to do it with your partner, okay? And the reason, you know, to use partner is oftentimes, or the wand, um, is, you know, it's difficult to get around the belly to reach down there. And I don't want you straining because if you're huffing and puffing and trying to get around your belly to reach down there into the muscles, then you're not really relaxing as you're massaging. Okay. So it kind of, you know, negates the point of doing the massage. Okay. So let's talk about, um, for any of the options, we're going to talk about, it's kind of like the same way we talk about it, um, for whatever options you end up using. So I'm just gonna turn this a little bit this way because I am going to sh show you the vagina. This is the vagina, guys. Okay, so <laughs> basically we're gonna talk about the vagina as a clock. Okay, so if this is the vagina, this is the perineal area down here. So this would be anal entrance down here. Okay, so 12 o'clock is the urethra where the urine comes out. Six o'clock is down here. 
three o'clock and the nine o'clock. Doesn't matter which way the clock is flipped, right? So three and nine can be on either side for perineal massage, okay? Or if you have pain with intercourse as well, okay? So pain with intercourse is slightly different, but for perineal massage, we're going from three o'clock to nine o'clock, okay? So those are the spots that we're doing. Okay, you don't really have to do up here unless you've come and seen me and I've told you you should do it up there because either there is, you know, um, pain with intercourse that's happening and there's sore spots up there or tight spots or if there's urinary urgency frequency and or pubic pain. Okay, otherwise, if you don't have any of those symptoms, you haven't, you know, experienced any of that, then you can just focus on the three o'clock to nine o'clock. Um, and what we're actually doing is, so if you're doing it by yourself or with your partner, by yourself, use your thumb, okay? Because it's going to be really hard for you to kind of like reach down there with your wrist all like this. And I don't want you straining yourself. So using the thumb is a better option. If with partner, your partner is going to use their index finger, okay? And then we're going to start at three o'clock. So finger has to be bent. Most of the finger is inside. Most common thing I hear from patients coming in if they're doing this with their partner they're just like, oh, I felt like skin stretching. That's because they didn't go in deep. You gotta go in deep, okay? And then you're pushing and pressing and holding for 30 seconds up to a minute, okay? After you do that, you can do little circles for another 30 seconds up to a minute. So basically you're spending about, you know, one to two minutes on each spot. So you do three o'clock, four o'clock, five o'clock, and then you can press straight down at six o'clock as well. That area is, that is truly the perineal area, but for a lot of people, that applies a lot of pressure into the bowel area, and they feel like they have to go to the bathroom. So if it feels super uncomfortable, just do it gently, and then you're going to carry on. At this point, you might have to switch fingers, okay, because now my even my own arm is getting kind of, you know, twisted. And then you would keep going. You would do six, seven, eight, nine, all the way to the other side, okay? What is actually being shown here? So that's, you're only doing that, obviously, with your partner, okay? So that's the first step. You would go around the clock. Okay. Second step is if you're doing it by yourself, okay, either with the wand again or using your thumb, you would at the end, and I'm just going to show it with my index finger, you can sweep. Okay. So you can sweep from three o'clock all the way to six, or you can go all the way to the other side. You might have to switch fingers and you're just applying pressure. Do the same thing on the other side. Finally, with your partner at the end, you can do either what they're showing you. So you would go in either with both thumbs, the partner would go in with both thumbs or index fingers, and they are pushing to the side and down. And you can do the circles like they're showing, okay? Or you can just actually sustain that pressure there. Okay, so those are the different techniques for perineal massage. If you've Googled perineal massage, and I've actually heard other people say this as well, that it should be painful. No. Okay. So discomfort's okay. If it feels like stretching, it's okay. It's a sensitive area in general. You know, it shouldn't go over a six out of 10 pain, but some people are saying you should feel eight out of 10 pain. Absolutely not. That's like going in for a massage where you're trying to relax and the massage therapist just getting in there. You're sweating because it's painful. It doesn't feel good. The muscles are contracting, right? So you want to make sure you're applying pressure, yes, to relax the muscles, but not so much that it's causing the muscles to contract, okay? And what the massage is actually doing is, so a lot of people say, okay, well, I'm actually like relaxing the muscles. We're training the brain, Okay, so I'm going to talk a little bit about this in terms of other places in the body. Okay, because a lot of people think, oh, I'm doing the massage, you know, by no means are we stretching so much like to the extent that it's like a baby's head, right? We're not doing that. What we're actually doing is training the muscles to feel that stretch. The brain then is trained to say, okay, that's okay for that area to be stretched. Okay, building that mind body connection so that when baby is coming out, first of all, Yes, you have, if you don't have an epidural, you would have that sensation of like, okay, this is stretching. Your brain, brain does not then go into panic mode being like, oh my gosh, what is happening? And contract everything. It's okay with that relaxation. I always compare it to, this is going to seem silly, to doing splits. Most people can't do splits, not because they don't have that range of motion. If we were put under anesthetic and all of our muscles were, you know, relaxed, everyone can go into the splits. The reason we stop at a certain point is because your brain senses that you're going to, you know, there's going to be danger, there's harm 
happening physical harm to your body and it literally stops you and that's why all the muscles contract and you can't go down so training for splits is you actually train your brain to say okay feeling the stretch is okay and next time i can go a little bit lower and then i can go a little bit lower and a little bit lower so when you're doing massage that's why we're doing it three to four times a week three four weeks onwards so you're telling your brain this pressure is okay this stretching is okay does that make sense okay so that is um if you're doing it with partner um same amount three to four times a week about 10 minutes um, and if you're doing it by yourself using your fingers, positioning wise, reclined versus lying down. Okay, not often do people actually want to lie down during pregnancy, um, anyways, especially around 34 weeks. So be reclined. Legs can be in whatever position you would like to, them to be, and you can use oil or water based lubricant um, as well. You don't have to use gloves. Obviously, I use gloves when patients are coming into the clinic. And then the wand, if you're wondering, so this is, I know it shows you there in the picture. So this is kind of what it looks like. So if you're like, okay, I'm going to do it by myself. So about half of my patients, I would say, um, do it um, by themselves. Um, so if you're doing it by yourself, not with partner, or you're like, okay, I have difficulty reaching down there, I can't go in as far as basically like having most of the finger inside, and you can't do it without straining, definitely get a wand. Only the first few inches go inside. I know it looks scary. The whole thing doesn't go inside. Most of the thing is there so that you can hold on to it so that you can um, actually access the vaginal entrance, okay, without straining. Um, if you search pelvic wand, you can find this online. I also sell it on my store, much cheaper than other people are selling it. Some people are selling it anywhere from $60 to $175, which is insane. Um, I sell it for $40, and you can find that on my website, okay? but you can just Google pelvic wand and a bunch of stuff will come up as well. Um, there's a few websites, just make sure that they're in USD. So if you're you know, not in the States right now, if you're in Canada, that'll kind of like, you know, bump up the price um, even more. So just be aware of that. Um, and I will just put it in here so you guys can check it out if you would like to. Any questions at this point about perineal massage? And I see something in the chat box already. Okay. Um, I was told by my friend that paranormal massage is an end important for labor. Why would she say this? I am not sure. Actually, one of the things. So, yeah, actually, I am sure why she would say this. So, midwives during a labor and delivery do perineal massage. That has been shown to be effective at uh, preventing tearing as well. I would say, regardless. I would get my clients to do perineal massage because there are studies out there that indicate it can help prevent severe tearing, especially for first time moms. It can help prevent third degree, which is going into the muscle, into the anal area, fourth degree, which is completely going through the anal area. And so, yes, what they do is amazing during labor, but it's also good still for you to prepare your body. So it's at, at the end, it's up to you what you want to do, but I'm just preventing or presenting the evidence out there and what the research says. And I go based on that. Um, and I mean, she has given you her opinion as well, but it's up to you kind of like to take this information and do with it what you would like to do. Okay. But I, in general, advocate for everybody. It doesn't matter. I'm telling everybody to do perineal massage. Okay. Any questions about perineal massage at this point in time? We are good. Okay. So let's move on. So breathing and stretches. This is anyone coming in, I tell them to focus on breathing and stretches, especially the last few weeks. Or if they're coming in and they have tight pelvic floor muscles, if I've assessed the muscles. And so these are generally the stretches. I'm not going to go through each one and show you guys. So you can kind of quickly Google it. The other thing I forgot to say at the beginning is, so anything I'm saying today, and I can't believe I have to say this, but I'm not prescribing any exercises today or any techniques because as per the College of Physiotherapists of Ontario and Alberta, so I'm registered for both, I technically can't prescribe anything unless I've done an assessment. So this is information I'm giving to you. I'm not prescribing anything and you can choose to use it as you wish. Okay, so breathing and stretches is generally what I am prescribing to my clients because doing stretches, especially anything that brings your knees up, kind of gets the pelvis into an area where the pelvic floor muscles can relax. So child's pose is a great one, which is what that picture is showing. Cobbler's pose, happy baby, deep squat. If you're able to get into a deep squat, okay, 
uh, and then pelvic tilting doing cat and cow and you can either sit um, on an exercise ball and you can also do the tilting and it's a soft surface for you to be on so that actually promotes the pelvic floor muscles to relax as well and you're not just doing the stretches the most important part is the breathing okay and we're going to be going over breathing with pushing as well as kegels but I just wanted to mention it right now. The breathing is the most important part because you're thinking about letting go, relaxing the pelvic floor muscles. Okay. And this in itself can be extremely beneficial for preparing for labor and delivery. Okay. Next up is Kegels. So some of you were at the last talk that I did. And at that time I we had gone over Kegels and I told you to do Kegels for about three weeks because it's been three weeks in between that talk and this one. So you can put in the chat box how it went if you did the Kegels. <laughs> Usually people are good at doing the Kegels for about like a week or two weeks, but if you've done them diligently, good for you. Um, and how it felt when you were doing the Kegels. For other people joining us today, we're going to go over exactly how to do a Kegel because 50% of women research shows are not doing Kegels properly and Kegels actually are not for everyone. Okay, immediately at some point in time, they are for everyone. But, but if you are experiencing uh, pelvic pain, pain with sex, if you're experiencing urinary urgency, frequency, chronic constipation, I usually give breathing and stretches first to make sure the pelvic floor is relaxed. And then we go over Kegels. There's no point in doing a Kegel if your muscles are already super contracted. Um, it's just going to, might potentially make things tighter in there. And so we want to focus on relaxing first and then contracting. So if you are experiencing any of those symptoms, I'm going to teach Kegels today. Maybe go see a pelvic floor physiotherapist because we have people, you know, in the talk from everywhere. So, you know, find someone close to you um, that does internal examinations that can tell you. Um, exactly how your pelvic floor muscles are doing and tell you and teach you how to do a Kegel after the assess and make sure your pelvic floor is okay. Because if the muscles are tight, that's not the first thing we would be doing. Okay. Okay, so someone just said I did the Kegels off and on. I've forgotten a lot. It felt good though. That's good. If people are forgetting, usually I tell them to do it in the shower. Um, it's, you were busy, it's hard, especially if you have other kids right? You're working a lot um, and it can kind of just slip our mind. So then just do it in the shower, right? Because um, we're, you know, kind of gives you some time. And also I tell people to do it in the shower postpartum because I'm like, that's the only alone time you're going to get. Okay. So what is a Kegel? Kegel is a pelvic floor contraction. So basically we're tightening and pulling up and in. Okay. A lot of people, and this is why probably a lot of people are not doing Kegels properly. And this is what I see when I'm assessing internally. A lot of people are doing this. Okay. We're not doing the pulling up and in. The pulling up and in is so important because that is the thing that's going to help treat and prevent leakages and prolapse. Okay. And that, those are kind of the big things that we're seeing postpartum as well. So that lifting inwards is important. So right now, what I want you to do is to find a spot where you're comfortable. So either, you know, you could be reclined right now, lying down, lying on your side. If you're sitting, please have back support. Back support is essential when you're first doing Kegels because otherwise your abdominal muscles are going to try to kick in. And the most important part right now is I just want you to try doing a Kegel. So do whatever you feel a Kegel is right now. Okay, so contract, release. And I just want you to try it right now so that you can compare it to afterwards after I give instructions on how to do a Kegel. Okay, so if you've done it a couple of times, great. So the most important part of doing a Kegel is the breathing. A lot of people tend to hold their breath when they're doing a Kegel or they're trying to kind of like inhale it in, but breathing is the most important part. So both hands on your lower belly right now. And what I want you to do is you're gonna do a very slow, long inhale into your belly, think about a balloon filling up or there's an umbrella inside your stomach that is opening as you inhale and closing as you exhale. So do that a few times. If you find your chest is lifting up quite a bit, I mean, during pregnancy, it is harder to breathe into the belly, but you should be able to breathe a little bit into the belly area. If you're not able to, a lot of people out there, they breathe into their chest. So this would be an exercise I give by itself 
knowing how to breathe into your belly is so important. If you look at someone who's 70 or 80 years old, they tend to go up here. And I've seen elderly people come in with pelvic floor conditions and it's hard to teach them how to do Kegels because they tend to breathe up there. So it's extremely important to breathe into your belly. Okay, so you're gonna do a nice long inhale into your belly and then a five second exhale out through your mouth with pursed lips. So I'm just gonna show you. So pretend there's a straw in between your lips and that's how you're blowing out. Not with force, I don't want happening. We're not blowing out candles because that's gonna engage your abdominal muscles, but just very, very slowly. Okay, on the next exhale, you're gonna start the exhale and then after that, like literally a microsecond, millisecond after that, you're gonna start the Kegel, okay, at the same time. And when you're doing the Kegel, I don't want this happening inside. You're just slowly contracting and slowly pulling up and in. And I'm gonna give you something, a visualization in a second, but I just want you to try that. It's like doing a slow bicep curl versus us doing this. You're going and you're slowly bringing in your arm and slowly extending it. So same thing. So on the inhale, you would relax everything. On the exhale, start the exhale and start the Kegel at the same time. If this feels hard to do. It feels hard for a lot of people. So don't worry. And this is probably the first time you might be doing Kegel correctly, and it can take some time and practice. On the next exhale, I want you to think about stopping the flow of pee. So stopping urine. So you're gonna do that nice long inhale, make sure your muscles are relaxing. Don't forget, you have to breathe into your belly. A lot of people start doing Kegels, and all of a sudden they're breathing into their chest. So inhale into the belly, and then as you're exhaling, you're thinking about stopping pee. So you're gonna do that a couple times. Awesome. And then once you're done that, we're gonna reset. And on the next exhale, I want you to think about a marble at the vaginal entrance. And as you're exhaling, it's like you're slowly pulling it up and in. Okay, and again, it's slow. Your abdominal muscles should not be crushing together. They should not be clenching. It just should feel very subtle into the pelvic area. And then as you inhale, you let it go. And then you can try that again. So generally, I'm gonna let you do that a couple times and I'll just continue talking. So generally, you can start with reclined, okay? And or side lying or completely lying down, it's up to your comfort level. Pretty soon after that, we go into sitting, then we go into standing. If someone is telling me, well, postpartum, I wanna return back to running and jumping, then we might do Kegels with squats. That is something else. You can use this technique for probably at least lying down, sitting and standing. After that, it gets a little bit more complicated. And then I would be kind of like assessing and teaching that um, based on kind of like the person's goals. But this will actually give you kind of a sense of how to do it in different positions. Kegels have been shown to prevent and treat leakages as well as prolapse. And Kegels have actually been shown to prevent tearing, which a lot of people are like, what? Are we tightening everything in there? So and if you've been told to stop doing Kegels at a certain point in time, no. You, so the only reason to stop is like if I've done an internal or another public physiotherapist has or you have any of those conditions, yeah, stop, you know, don't do Kegels for a little bit, but eventually you should do Kegels. But during pregnancy, if you've been told, you know, at 35 weeks you should stop doing or 34 weeks you should stop doing Kegels, no. You should be able to, you should know how to voluntarily contract and relax your muscles. That's the point of doing a Kegel. You're strengthening, but you're able to relax as well. And that's why it helps to prevent tearing so that your body knows which one is which. Okay, and so I get my patients to continue on until the end really to do Kegels. And then I get them to, I used to say, start doing Kegels day one postpartum. I've moved away from that now. Um, just cause you know, there's a lot of stuff going on on day one. So I usually say week one postpartum, you should start your Kegels. Don't wait until our six week appointment. So I generally see my patients as six weeks postpartum where I'm checking for prolapse, any tearing, scar tissue, abdominal separation, all that stuff, the pelvic floor strength. And I tell them don't wait until our six week appointment because that's six weeks without any exercises. If you had a knee replacement day one, 
So the, that's why I used to say day one. Day one, they would be doing exercises. Okay, so it's very important to do your Kegels postpartum. And that's why I say do them in the shower. And also doing them in standing is better than doing them lying down because standing, that's oftentimes when a lot of people are saying, well, I'm coughing or sneezing and standing, that's when I'm having leakage. But if you, standing feels too hard, do them in the other positions. And generally, I give about 20 kegels to do. So I'm like 10, stopping pee, 10 marble. You don't have to do a ton of them. And nobody has time to do that. Um, any questions about kegels? Okay, good. Either I'm doing a really good job at explaining things or, <laughs> okay, hopefully that's kind of clear for everybody. Okay, perfect. So pushing, okay, because 70% of people wanted to know about pushing, which is awesome. And I think this is kind of one of the big things that um, is not covered in prenatal classes. That's what my um, patients have told me as well. I'm just looking at the chat box. Um, uh, totally missed the whole thing about Kegels, how to do it properly. So I'll email you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, no worries. Um, and then there's another question coming through. Uh, okay. For Kegels, is there a sensation you can feel if you inserted a finger to know if you're doing it right? So yes, if you've, without straining, right? Because, okay, yes. So if you, it's called digital exam. So using one of your digits. So if you insert a finger and you do a Kegel, you should feel closing and pulling up and in. If you feel this happening or it's just closing, most of the time it's because the abdominal muscles are really trying to contract and help you out. So just make sure the abs are not contracting or the bum muscles, like the outside muscles as well. Okay, but that is what you should feel. Having said that, if you have to strain to feel down there, then that's pressure downwards, and then you might not be doing a proper Kegel when you're feeling it. If that makes sense, it's like kind of like if you're crunching, that's gonna be a lot of pressure downwards, your pelvic floor muscles won't be able to contract as much. So you might get a different sensation than if you were doing it without the finger there. So as long as you can feel down there without straining, then that is what you should be feeling. Okay. So you've probably read the slide already. So there's a lot of controversy and talk about, you know, should we do holding the breath and pushing? Should we be breathing and pushing? And they use different terminology and research. And you can already see they're using different uh, terminology there. So directed pushing is when someone is directing you to do it a certain way. And most of the time, the direction is to do an inhale, hold your breath for 10 seconds and push really hard. Okay, while well, you sustain that push. So you can see there, so the World Health Organization uh, recommends, you know, not doing breath holding. Uh, American College of Nurse Midwives recommends allowing the body to guide pushing. So they're saying, you know, allow the woman to do whatever she feels like doing, what the natural impulse is. And then same thing with the American College of OBs and gynecologists. Despite this, okay, so in Calgary, it's a little bit better. So I moved from uh, Toronto last August. So it's been about eight months, nine months now. And definitely there, whenever someone came in, most of my patients coming in, if they were at the hospital with nurses and OBs, uh, this is just what they were telling me. They were telling me um, that they were, if they were coming to me postpartum, um, or regardless of that, if they had seen me during pregnancy and, and then I had taught them different techniques, um, I was being told by my patients that they were being told to do directed pushing, so holding the breath. Here, it's a little bit better in Calgary. Um, and I'm not kind of like too sure like why there is that difference um, because this is kind of like what the guidelines say, right? And uh, for sure, I think that, you know, there might be a kind of like a time crunch. A lot of people are coming in. So they're like, if we just get them to like direct them to push a certain way, we can get, you know, them out of labor um, and deliver sooner. So maybe that plays a part, I'm not sure. But either way, I just think it's really important to have different techniques, have different tools for your toolkit, because then what happens is because during the delivery, you're gonna feel that impulse to push. With epidural, it is a little bit less, but regardless, um, if you feel that impulse, then you can use whatever tool works for you best. So today I'm going to give you some tools because it's good to have those tools. 
I'm not going to be offended if you don't use any of my tools. If you get too labor and you're like, oh, actually, this is working better for me, do that. Okay, but at least you can try different things for yourself. Okay, uh, Tracy, as a birth doula and childbirth educator in Calgary for many years, I'll say that almost all care providers use directed pushing. Interesting. Okay, yeah, so that's good information for me to have as well. Yeah. Um, yeah, because it just goes against kind of like the, what the organizations, the regulatory bodies are saying. So Lindsay is uh, chiming in. She's saying she agrees as well. Um, so Lindsay is also a doula. So yeah, it just blows my mind that, you know, if it was for anything else, it's like, oh, there's heart disease. We need to follow these standard guidelines. Okay, let's do that. But for, you know, labor, why are we not doing that? Because there, there's actually not a lot of good research about spontaneous pushing, which is basically allowing the woman to do whatever she wishes to do and comparing it to directed pushing. Uh, we need better studies out there, but the studies that are out there shows there's no real difference in between, um, you know, tearing and between other outcomes. There is one study that came out that was a better study that I just looked at last week, and they were talking about breath holding or having, um, it's called open glottis, so breathing as you're pushing and women who were breathing as they were pushing had less tearing. Um, they had um, less severity of tearing as well. And I, I personally, when I'm doing an internal exam, if someone's coming in, I'm looking to make sure their muscles are relaxing. They're able to lengthen their muscles with a different tool. So I'm actually going to go over open glottis, so how to breathe and push and then closed glottis. So just closing, um, the throat and pushing at the same time because for some of my patients that actually works well okay but for most people i would say when they're holding their breath and they're pushing when i'm doing an internal examination i feel clenching okay and it's a natural response if you think about it, if you hold your breath generally when people are, are lifting something and they pull their back what did they do they were lifting and they held their breath versus if you lift and you breathe much less chance of pulling your back Okay, so pushing techniques. Okay, so for this, I want you to get into a comfortable position. If you are one of my clients, because some of my patients are actually on just for review as well. So we've already gone through pushing techniques. I've done an internal exam. I've told you which one works best for you. So you might want to practice that one. You can still try the other ones that I'm going to go over today. When we're going over pushing techniques, you should feel lengthening and relaxation, downward pressure in the vaginal muscles. You should not feel what we felt when we were doing a Kegel. So if you feel that, I would highly recommend going to see a pelvic floor physiotherapist in your area. Okay, I, again, I know there's people from everywhere here, just make sure the pelvic floor physiotherapist you go to does prenatal care because other public floor physiotherapists, they might see, you know, general population as well. They might not know different pushing techniques, okay? And if there is no public floor physiotherapist in your area, then I, I do virtual visits, but it's only in Ontario as well as Alberta. That's uh, where my license is. But if you are um, in a different province, I can help you find someone as well, okay? Just by like looking at their bio, I should know if they do prenatal care and stuff like that. Okay, so get into a comfortable position. We are going to go over breathing first. So this breathing is similar to the breathing that we did. We're just gonna focus on the inhale right now that we did with Kegels. And this is the inhale that you're going to use um, when you're doing different breathing and stretches to help relax the pelvic floor, which was a different slide from earlier on. Okay, so it's great for relaxing the muscles. So you're just going to have both hands on your lower belly. So you can either be reclined at this point, you could be seated. And all I want you to do is a nice long inhale, five second inhale into your lower belly. And again, just focus on letting go, relaxing the pelvic floor muscles. And if you're having difficulty breathing into your belly, think about a balloon filling up or, and or think about um, an umbrella opening as you inhale and closing as you exhale. And the inhale really matters and the speed at which you do the inhale. So if you're still struggling with doing a belly breath, the first sip of the inhale needs to be slow because if you go really fast, it's gonna immediately go into your chest. So just practice doing an inhale, exhale right now. And that's all I want you to do a few times as I talk about the jaw. 
And you're probably like, why is she wanting to talk about the jaw? So there's a relationship between your jaw and your pelvic floor muscles, which I know sounds wild. So when we're doing a Kegel, when you're exhaling, that's why I actually get you to purse your mouth. Okay, so by pursing your mouth, it activates the jaw muscles, which attach to your spine and go all the way down to your pelvic floor muscles. So if you're contracting up here, it's actually gonna help you do a Kegel. And that's why we exhale out through the mouth versus the nose when we're doing a Kegel. Okay, when we are doing pushing, especially with breathing, we want a relaxed jaw. You don't want your jaw tight because that's gonna tighten down there. So we want it to be relaxed. So we're gonna go over breathing and pushing first. So I'm gonna turn sideways so you can kind of see me. And this is actually better than in the clinic because I have a mask on so you can actually see my mouth. So you're gonna pretend that you have a mirror in front of you that you are trying to fog up. And you don't have to have your hand there. If you want to have your hand there, you can have your hand there. I'm just doing it for visual effects right now. So I'm gonna inhale into my belly as I exhale, jaw wide open. <sighs> Making a loud, you can actually, you can do, <sighs> or you can do, <sighs> oh God, my voice is awful. <laughs> so you can do whichever one you want. Usually I'm teaching the <sighs> breath. Okay, and pretend you're trying to fog up a mirror in front of you. Because relaxing the jaw like that, that actually helps to relax the pelvic floor muscles. Okay, so that's the breath that we want to do. I just call it the ha breath or fogging up the mirror breath. So I just want you to practice that a bunch of times right now because that is the foundation of everything. Okay, and if you're just doing a little kind of like that, no, pretend you're an opera singer a male opera singer, and you have to really get that breath down into your belly. And so you're going to do a nice long inhale, and then you're going to go. <sighs> okay, try that a few times. Let me know if there's any questions. Because that's the first part. Because I want to give enough time, because sometimes I can go too fast with stuff. Okay. I'm assuming everything is good. Okay, second part is we're gonna talk about normal breathing, okay? So as you inhale, stomach should expand, air is coming in. As you exhale, air is leaving your body, so stomach should come back in. But when we are pushing, we actually, on the exhale, because we're going to be pushing on the exhale, we don't want the stomach to come back in. We want it to go out. So I'm just going to show you because it's probably confusing. It's better if I just show you. So I'm going to sit sideways. Okay. So I'm going to do a regular inhale, exhale, so you can see what I'm talking about. So I'm going to, and I, I don't have back support, so I'm just going to use my arm here. So I'm going to inhale. There it comes in. As I exhale, I should come back out. Okay. This is what I want to happen. As you are exhaling and pushing, we're going to use our lower abdominal muscles. So I'm going to inhale and then I'm going to exhale. <sighs> Let me know if you were able to see that. So I'm going to do it again, but I'm just going to do it like the short version. I want you to use your lower abdominal muscles to do this. You're pushing outwards as you are exhaling. Does that make sense? I know it probably, for a lot of my patients, they're like, what? <laughs> okay, but I want you to try it. We're doing different techniques. So just try it. If it doesn't work for you, there's other stuff we're going to go over. Okay, but I want you to inhale. And as you're doing the, you're using your lower abdominal muscles and have your hands down low. So I'm not pregnant, so you're not going to see it move too much. But it should go out like this as you're exhaling. So I'm just going to do the full thing. So Okay, a lot of people think the pushing comes from down here. It's your abdominal muscles that are doing the pushing. So just try that a few times. If you find you're having difficulty with the stomach moving out, don't breathe too much into the lower belly. Because if you maximally breathe into the lower belly, you might not be, like, there's no other room to, like, push outwards. So then try doing, like, a mid-chest breath. You can even do a little bit of chest. I'm usually okay with that. Okay, but then on the exhale, you're trying to use the lower abdominal muscles. Okay, try that a few times. Please have back support. It's hard to do without back support at the beginning. 
Okay, so just try that out for me. You should feel, so for a lot of people, they at that point immediately, they're like, oh, I feel my pelvic floor muscles moving down as I do that. Okay, so if you're feeling that, that's awesome. Okay, and, and this is, I just want you to keep in mind, like you're just discovering what feels best for you at this point. I'm not telling you do it this way. If you're like, eh, that one felt like whatever. Okay, we have a bunch of other coming up, so that's okay. But if you're like, wow, that was great. I love that one. Then that's the one you're going to practice. Okay, especially, I mean, like if you're 18 weeks, you don't really have to practice it like that much right now. But I would probably do it once a week. But if you're, you know, like 34, 35 weeks, go into different positions, recline, sideline, squat on all fours and practice this. Okay, is everyone okay with that technique before I move on to the, the I'm going to add a, a different part to that. So what I want you to do is, and I only do this with some of my clients. So at the end of, as you're exhaling and pushing out with the abdominal muscles, I want you to focus on um, relaxing and letting go of the pelvic muscles. So you should feel kind of like pressure at the vaginal entrance as you do that. If you don't, a lot of people tend to do a Kegel when I tell them to do that. Just focus on the lower abdomen then. Okay, so just try that. And um, there's a question. Should we be doing the mirror breathing out for five seconds with the lower abdominal pushing? The breathing depends. So you can do a sustained push five to seven seconds. Everyone's breath is different. Like I am able to exhale for a long period of time. So I'm just going to... That was a long time. Most people, they can't do it for that long. I'm good with three seconds, five seconds, seven seconds. You can vary it. You can do, you know, a more powerful push with like two seconds. That's okay too. Play around with the exhale as long as your jaw is relaxed. Okay. So just try the last bit where the pelvic floor relaxation, if that felt weird or if you felt contracting, or if you're still like not feeling much in the pelvic floor, that's fine. Okay, next technique we're gonna do, we're actually gonna do, we're gonna do the breath holding. Okay, so I actually want you to, um, so your inhale stays the same. In this case, what we're gonna do is, you're going to hold your breath and pretend like you're having a bowel movement and push like you're having a bowel movement because that's actually what they're telling people to do um, at the hospital. And I would say it works for mm, 10 to 15%, 15%, 20% of my patients. Okay, so just try that. So you're going to do a nice big inhale into the chest, hold your breath, and push like you're having a bowel movement. And just see how that feels on the pelvic floor and compare it to the one before. And you can put it in the chat box. You'd be like, it felt tight. It felt like, you know, I was lengthening my pelvic muscles. It felt like there was downward pressure. Just let me know. Because I just want to make sure you guys find the one that works best for you. Because for a certain subset of people, they are able to relax and let go of their muscles as they are holding their breath. So yes, I want, yeah, I honestly can't not, yeah. Okay, so I'm just going to address them in order. So when I teach this in the clinic, when I teach the breathing first, and then I'm like, hey, hold your breath and push. A lot of people they just naturally start breathing out. And they're like, oh no, I'm sorry, I was supposed to hold my breath. And I'm like, no, no, that's okay, try again. Because exactly, a lot of people feel like they naturally want to exhale. Yeah, I can't breathe, hold, breath pushing. Exactly, thank you. Yeah, and a lot of people, yeah, I feel like I'm gonna strain my back. Yes, exactly. So that's what I was talking about. A lot of people strain their back when they're holding their breath and lifting something, right? So instead of holding your breath the whole time, okay, there was something somebody had actually asked, hold breath for, yeah, okay. So if you've tried the holding breath and pushing, um, I want you to just try it a different way. So you're going to inhale, you're going to exhale, oh, sorry, not, you're going to hold your breath and I want you to start pushing down like you're having a bowel movement, then exhale. Okay, so I'm gonna show you. So, so you're still, still doing that ha breath at the end, but with a mild pause in between where you start the push. Cause it's hard for a lot of people to just start the pushing when they're breathing, it's too much at once. So just start the push and then start the exhale. 
and let me know how that one goes. So again, we're going to, I know this is a little kind of like a lot of information. So you're going to inhale into the, you know, either wherever feels comfortable for you. You're going to hold your breath. Just gently push like you're having a bell movement. Sustain that push as you're exhaling out the same ha breath that we did before. For some people, this works good. For others, they still like the breathing and pushing. Okay, so just try it out a few times. And then I'm going to change it just a little bit more because I actually don't like it when people are being told to push like they're having a bowel movement. That's not where baby's coming out. Baby is coming out vaginally. Okay. And that's actually one of the reasons why preparing for labor can help decrease the like, anal incontinence, which is what I had mentioned at the beginning, the benefits of preparing because we should be pushing where baby's coming out. Okay. That's where we should be kind of like bearing down towards so with pick whichever one you like the best okay and i want you to either as you're exhaling or you're holding breath or you're holding your breath and then you're doing the exhale at the end the focus should be vaginal okay so just it's just easier for a lot of people to think about that area because we all do bowel movements regularly so but i want you to have that feeling but vaginally Okay, and Whitney says the third technique was the best. Maybe prolongs the length of the push. Once I run out of breath, I can't push too much anymore. Yeah, exactly. That's why we're using our breath, right? Yeah. And then it also, just breathing, I mean, you get less exhausted, right? If you're constantly holding your breath, decreasing oxygen to your body, it's just better to do the breath, breathing for certain people. For most people, 75% of my clients. Okay, so pick whichever one worked best for you. Okay, the first one, we're, we're just going to review it again. Okay, so you're going to do, and I know I'm already over an hour here. I want to leave some time for questions as well. So you're going to do a nice, long, yeah, you might feel like you're getting an ab work. Oh, yeah, because we're using our abs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Yes, there should be no pain, though. So you're going to inhale as you exhale, relax, jaw using the lower abdominal muscles to push out. You should literally see, feel your lower abdominal muscles moving outwards. It's like you're trying to push the hands away. And at the end of that, if you want to, you can add that gentle push vaginally. Again, most people tend to, at that point, do a Kegel and contract their muscles. So I only give that for a subset of people. So if just the pushing with the abs work, is working for you, that's good. That is good enough because it's really that pressure that we're building upwards that's going to come down and get baby out because where is baby sitting, right? And then slowly descending. So we want to use the power of the abdomen. Okay, then you can try the second one, which is basically holding your breath and pushing like you're having a bowel movement, but do it vaginally. So inhale, hold your breath and push, push, push. That's where you're going to be told, push, push, push. And then the last one was, again, inhaling, holding your breath, starting the push, sustaining the push as you're exhaling. Okay, any questions about any of this right now? I just want to see what the next slide is. Oh, yeah. Okay. Because I, I want to talk about C-section prevention because we have a couple of doulas on um, the call here, which is amazing. Thank you so much for uh, joining us. So a lot of my clients come in for pelvic physiotherapy and they're like, okay, help me prepare for labor and delivery. And can you also make sure I don't get a C-section? I'm like, okay, I can't guarantee anything for sure. But um what actually helps to prevent C-sections, cesareans, uh, or doula. So doula is a birth support person. They would be present at your birth um, and they help emotionally and physically support. Um, and having a doula present is effective in reducing C-sections by 28 to 56%, which is insane. 
by almost half, up to half, or more than half, um, decreasing use of pain medications, um, any instruments being used, so using a vacuum or forceps uh, to get baby out, tearing, and labor time. So it's never too late to get a doula if you would like to have a doula. If you have any specific questions for doulas, they are present here, so you can put them in the chat box. And maybe at this point in time, if uh, Lindsay and Tracy, if you want to put in your information as well, where people can contact you to have a little bit of information about how you support prenatally, if they want to do a call with you as well, how it works uh, during COVID, that kind of thing. If you support postpartum, that would be great. Um, I think at some point in time, I would want to do more of a live chat. It's good, you know, for everyone to learn a little bit more about uh, what doulas do and how they can support. So we can do that down the line as well. Okay, there's a bunch of stuff in the chat box. Uh, Michelle, okay, Lindsay, thank you for sharing that. Perfect. Yeah, so if you have any questions about that, please put them in the chat box or you can reach out to Lindsay. And then I think Tracy was present too. I'm not sure if she still is, but um, Tracy Hudson as well. Okay. Oh, there we go. Perfect. Awesome. Okay. So Michelle is asking if you're giving directed pushing with these replaced that then even if your exhale isn't 10 seconds. Yeah, I'm not sure where the 10 second rule comes from. Honestly. So I haven't seen a lot of research of like, why are we doing 10 seconds? Right. So I think it's just to have enough pressure for a certain period of time to allow, you know, baby to slowly come out. Um, with these replace that even if your exhale isn't 10 seconds. So one of the things, so I just want to address this. So if you're given directed pushing. So you're never given anything. You can advocate for yourself. Doulas are great to have by your side um, or your partner can advocate for you in terms of what your wishes are. If you're absolutely like, I don't want to do directed pushing, doesn't matter, right? What they say, you get to make that decision. No one is telling you. It's like if someone goes to the doctor, they're giving medication. I mean, it's up to you if you want to take it or not, right? So, but if it's in your best interest at that point in time, if they're like, okay, labor is not, you know, it's not progressing, well, what else can we do? Should we use breathing? Can we do different positions? That kind of thing. Um, and so if you have tried my technique, it's not working. Like one of the techniques and you're like, okay, the only thing at this point in time that is going to work is doing the breath holding and pushing. That's still okay in certain instances to do i would say it really just depends on your pelvic muscles like i said if somebody comes in for some people i had somebody come in you know a few a couple weeks ago we tried the breathing it just was not working i was like okay you're gonna like she that person was really good at holding her breath and actually lengthening her muscles most people hold their breath and tighten their muscles and i wonder if that's what's causing tearing right so doing less than 10 seconds should be okay as long as you're able to sustain that pressure downwards and you can take another inhale and then just continue pushing on the exhale. Perfect. Okay, let me know if you guys have any other questions either in the question box or the chat there. Oh yes, okay. And then finally, pelvic floor physiotherapy. So um, last talk, I didn't spend a lot of time on this. I'm still only gonna you know, spend like a little bit unless you guys have any questions. So what we do is, so I'm assessing the core when someone comes in. So whether someone is coming in prenatally, say, you know, after the first trimester, either virtually or in person, I'm seeing how their back is moving, how their hips are moving, the strength in the hips, the abdominal muscles, and then obviously virtually I'm not checking the pelvic floor, but in person I am checking to see how the muscles are, how the perineal area is, what the strength is like, if there's any prolapse, and then based on that I'm giving treatment. So if someone comes in with issues, we are treating those issues during pregnancy. If that's 
pain, prolapse, whatever it may be. Uh, if someone is coming in and they're saying, well, I don't have any issues, I'm just here for prevention, then we're obviously not doing as many sessions. Um, and we're, I'm giving certain exercises to do, um, depends on when they come in. If it's 18 weeks, I'm like, okay, do these exercises for a few weeks. If anything comes up, you know, call me, come on in. Otherwise, I'm going to see you at 34 weeks or 33 weeks. I generally tend to do like 32 to 33 weeks. Um, and that's when we're going to go over uh, perineal massage, pushing techniques that work for you because I want to assess the muscles and make sure you're able to lengthen and relax those muscles as you're doing one of these techniques. And I ensure, you know, we get the technique down during the session and then postpartum, um, I'm guiding towards when you're ready to return back to fitness based on the internal exam. So if I see any prolapse, I'm saying, okay, maybe no crunches right now. Don't do planking, running, jumping. We're slowly going to get you there. We need to strengthen first. I check for abdominal separation as well. Most of the time, um, so pelvic floor physiotherapy would be covered under general physiotherapy. Uh, you don't need a referral from a doctor, but unless your insurance is saying you need a doctor's note, in which case you would need one. And then the assessment um myself i spent 50 minutes doing the assessment to get a pretty good history and all that stuff and then at the end i sent an email out with the exercises um and then you know it's half an hour for treatment um big question i usually get is how many sessions will i need i'm not sure it depends on the assessment depends on your goals if you come in and you're like 34 weeks i want to learn pushing well, that's probably one session prenatally and then we'll do you know one at least to check uh, how you're doing postpartum but if someone comes in with pain with leakages with prolapse they might need a few sessions